Focus on IELTS. Students' Book by Sue O'Connell. Published by Pearson Education Limited. Cassette One, Side One. Unit Two. Focus on Listening One. Students' Union Survey. Section One. You will hear a student being interviewed as part of a students' union survey. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played twice. Hi, I'm from this students' union. We're doing a survey of students' eating habits. Is it all right if I ask you a few questions? The survey is about eating habits, so the answer is C. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to seven. Hi, I'm from the students' union. We're doing a survey of students' eating habits. Is it all right if I ask you a few questions? Oh, will it take long? No, not really. Five minutes, maybe. There aren't all that many questions. And what's it for exactly? Well, we wanted to get an idea of the sort of things students eat on a regular basis, and find out how aware people are about diet and nutrition and things. The idea is to produce an information leaflet about healthy eating. Oh yeah, I suppose something like that would be quite useful. A leaflet, I mean. Well, especially for new students. Mm. Uh, anyway, what do you want to know exactly? Okay, first question. What would you say your favourite food is? No,、oh, that's easy. A burger and chips. Lots of chips. <laughs> well,、uh, I must say, I like a nice Chinese meal as well, and maybe spaghetti once in a while. But no, the best has got to be a burger. Okay. And what's your least favourite food? Hmm. Let me think. Well, I've never been that keen on cauliflower or fish. The smell puts me off. <laughs> But、uh, no, the thing I really can't stand is salad, rabbit food. I call it. <laughs> I, I know lettuce and things are supposed to be healthy and all that, but、oh, it's just not a real meal, is it? Hmm. Tut tut. You're getting into some bad habits there, you know. Anyway, moving on. Let's take a typical day. How many meals do you have? I mean, proper sit-down meals, not snacks. Well, I nearly always oversleep, which means I generally skip breakfast altogether, and then I'll well, probably just have a bar of chocolate for lunch. So, in answer to your question, I don't sit down to a proper meal till the evening. Okay, typical student, I suppose.、Mm -hmm. And the next question: How many eggs would you eat in a week? One, two? Well, I don't do much cooking as a rule, but every Sunday I make myself a nice fried breakfast as a treat. That's sausages, bacon, and two eggs. The works, lovely. That sounds okay once a week, but I wouldn't recommend it on a regular basis. Too much fat.、Mm. And how about fresh fruit? Does it figure in your diet at all? Nah, not really. Well, I know it's bad, but well, I'm just not in the habit, really. Well, I suppose I might eat an apple once in a blue moon, but that's about it. Pity, but I suppose it's better than nothing. And would you say you had a sweet tooth? No,、oh, I guess so. Well, most people have, haven't they? <laughs> Me, I can't resist a bar of chocolate. <laughs> okay, one more question: Is eating healthily important to you at all? I mean, would you choose one thing rather than another because it was more healthy? No, I can't say that I would. I don't really think there's any difference in taste. I think all this craze for organic food is rubbish. That's just a way to make money. Okay. Well, that's more or less it, apart from the last section.
The interviewer asks the student for some details about himself. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Write no more than three words for each answer. If I could just take a couple of personal details. Your name? It's not obligatory, actually. Oh, that's all right. I'm Jamie Buckingham. Is that Buckingham as in the palace? Sorry? <gasps> yeah, <laughs> that's right. B U C K. I-N-G-H-A-M Mm-hmm, got that. And which course are you on, Jamie? I'm doing a degree in travel and tourism. Mm, lucky you. That's in the business studies faculty, right? Correct. And which year are you in? I'm in my second year. One more to go. <laughs> right, that's everything. Thanks a lot for your help. No problem. Cheers. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 2. Focus on listening 2. Healthy eating. Section 2. You'll hear a short talk about healthy eating. First, look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. I think that's all I need to say at this stage by way of an introduction to the college. But just to round off the morning, we can turn to something different, a subject which I think is close to most people's hearts, food. So let me introduce Linda Golding, the college welfare officer. Linda. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yes. I'm here to say a few words about healthy eating. And the first thing I want to emphasize is the importance of a balanced diet. The right balance is vitally important for health, both mental and physical, especially when you're studying hard or under stress. I know it's tempting to eat a lot of snacks and takeouts, but remember that they tend to contain a lot of sugar and fat, and we eat too much sugar. Did you know that in Europe and the USA, we're eating about 20 times as much sugar as we did in 1800. Shocking, isn't it? And also five times as much fat. No wonder there's been a huge increase in heart disease and other illnesses in the West. So in the short time I've been allotted, I'd like to run through some basic principles. Now, one of the most important things to include in our diet is fresh fruit and vegetables. The advice is that we should be aiming to eat five servings every day. It sounds a lot, I know, but you soon reach that if you have a banana with your breakfast, an apple at lunch, and three vegetables with your evening meal. Secondly, most of us need to try and reduce our sugar intake. Remember that many processed foods and ready meals contain sugar. And the one thing to be especially careful about is carbonated drinks like lemonade and cola. They're usually packed full of sugar. So avoid carbonated drinks and choose water or fruit juice instead. It's better for you. Another thing to watch is your fat intake. Most of the fat in our diet comes from meat and dairy products. So try and stick to lean meat, poultry and fish, and make a point of choosing low-fat dairy products. 
things like yogurts or skimmed milk. Oh, and don't buy hard cooking fat. Use sunflower oil instead. Next, we all know that cholesterol is a bad word. It's found in meat and dairy products, of course, but don't forget that it's also in eggs. So limit the number of eggs you eat to three or four a week. That's what the health experts suggest. Now, just a couple more points. Most of us eat far too much salt, and that can lead to high blood pressure. So cut down the amount of salt you add to food. When you're cooking, try using lemon juice instead as a way of enhancing the flavor. Finally, don't be tempted to skip meals. It's much better for your health if you eat regular light meals three times a day rather than just one enormous meal. Now, just for fun, here's a question for you. What do you think is the world's most nutritious fruit? An apple, would you say, or an orange? Well, you may be surprised. It's actually an avocado pear. You know, those dark green fruits you see in salads sometimes? Avocado pears contain about 165 calories for every 100 grams. That's more than eggs or milk. They also contain twice as much protein as milk and more vitamin A, B, and C. Well, that's all I have time for now. And yes, it's lunchtime. So enjoy your meal and be healthy. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 4. Focus on listening 1. Wasting energy. Section 3. In this section, you will hear two students, Susan and Peter, giving a presentation during a tutorial. In the first part, Susan talks about the problem of waste in cities. First, look at questions 1 and 2. Now listen to the first part of the presentation and answer questions 1 and 2. Good morning, everyone. Now, uh, whose turn is it to do their mini-presentation today? Uh, Peter and Susan. OK. What topic do the two of you decide on in the end? We thought we'd have a look at the problem of waste in cities. Fine. Well, when you're ready. <laughs> OK. One of the many problems about cities is that they create such an enormous amount of rubbish. Um, I've got some figures here to show you. Um, how does this thing work? Press the on button. <laughs> right. Well, as you can see from the graph, New York produces about 15 million kilograms of waste a day. It's a world record. But not exactly one to be proud of. No. And Tokyo comes next with about 11 million. Basically, the richer the city, the more rubbish it generates. The thing is that in developing countries, much more waste is recycled, so there's less to dispose of. If you compare Los Angeles and Calcutta, for example, they both have roughly the same population, but Los Angeles produces about 10 million kilograms of rubbish, while Calcutta, a much poorer city, only produces half of that, 5 million kilograms. You forgot to mention Mexico City. Yes. Mexico City's huge, but it only generates about 7 million kilograms, less than half the figure for New York. Now, the big question is, what do we do with all this rubbish? At the moment, most of it ends up on rubbish tips or buried underground, which is a terrible waste of resources. In the second part of the presentation, Peter talks about the process by which materials break down or biodegrade. Look at questions 3 to 10 first.
As you listen to the second part of the presentation, answer questions 3 to 10. And there's another problem, which Peter will talk about. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Sue. Yes, the other thing is that it can take an incredibly long time for rubbish to biodegrade, that is, to break down and decay. Um, just to give you an idea, food and other organic material is the quickest to biodegrade. A loaf of bread decays in about 20 days, for example, as long as the conditions are right. We throw away tons of newspapers and packaging, and paper takes anything from three months to a year to biodegrade, but the conditions have to be damp. In dry conditions, it can last for decades. Metals take even longer, obviously. Most, like tin or iron, can take anything between one and ten years. But that doesn't apply to aluminium, does it? And 80% of soft drink cans are made of aluminium. No, that's right. Aluminium's a special problem because it doesn't rust. So recycling is really the only answer. And another major problem is plastics. There are 80 different types, for a start. Scientists think a typical item like a bottle could take a hundred years to decay. But as plastic has only been around for about a century, we can only really guess. And the longest lasting of all is glass. We know from archaeological evidence that glass can survive for at least 4,000 years, and who knows, maybe longer. Thanks, Peter. Now, just to round off, I wanted to say a word about some of the factors which can affect the process of biodegrading. One is temperature. Things decay more quickly when it's warm, and more slowly in cool temperatures. Another factor is humidity. A moist environment speeds up decay. And the third is oxygen. That's a bit more difficult, because some materials, like oil, need the presence of oxygen to break down, while others don't. OK. Good work, both of you. Now, are there any questions? That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 4. Focus on listening to. Case study. Sao Paulo. Section 4. You'll hear a lecturer talking about the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Is everyone here? Good. Well, last week we talked about the astonishing growth of the world's cities, if you remember. And today I want to look at some of the reasons for this. What is it that draws people to leave their homes and families and move to big cities? To answer this question, I'm going to take Sao Paulo in Brazil as an example. First, some basics. Now, there's a fact sheet on Sao Paulo in your books, but I think it's slightly out of date, so let me give you the correct information and you can make any changes, OK? Well, the city dates back to the 16th century, 1554 to be precise. By 1970, it had a population of 7.8 million. Not quite a mega city, but growing fast. I think your book gives the present population as 15.2 million, doesn't it? But the most recent figure I have is 16.5 million, which means the population has more than doubled since 1970. That makes Sao Paulo the world's third largest city, according to UN statistics. But other cities are growing even faster. And if UN projections are correct, by the year 2015, Sao Paulo will have fallen to the fourth largest city after Tokyo, Mumbai, formerly Bombay, and Lagos in Nigeria. 
Sao Paulo is South America's leading industrial city, and two of its most significant manufacturing products are cars and computers. On the agricultural side, Brazilian coffee is world famous, as you know, and Sao Paulo is the country's main centre for the coffee trade. Now, I hope you managed to get all that. In the second part, the lecturer describes the various factors which affect migration to Sao Paulo. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen carefully and complete the table. Write no more than three words for each answer. Now let's look at a survey which was carried out among migrants to Sao Paulo. These are people living in the favelas, or shanty towns, on the outskirts of the city. And the aim was to find out why they decided to leave their homes and move there. One set of reasons for migration are described as push factors. A typical push factor was that there had been a poor harvest, for example. Another was that there wasn't enough money to make improvements to farms, so old farms remained inefficient and uneconomic to run. Some migrants said that opportunities for education were very limited in the countryside, and others mentioned problems to do with the weather. The main reason given here was floods. Floods occur from time to time after heavy rain, and they can cause terrible damage to farmland, homes and other property. Another set of reasons are pool factors, or factors which attracted migrants into the city. The main pool factor people mentioned was that cities offered more variety of work. Employment opportunities are obviously much more limited in the countryside. In addition, migrants mentioned that wages are much higher in Sao Paulo than they are for similar work in smaller towns and villages. Another pool factor mentioned in the survey was entertainment opportunities. Things like cinemas, clubs and sporting events. And we all know how the Brazilians love football. People also mentioned the fact that there were better hospitals and health facilities available in town. Last but not least, some people said that if your relations already live in the city, it makes the move easier because you have someone to help you settle in, find work, etc. The survey also looked at migration obstacles. That is, things which can stop migrants moving to the city. The main one here is a question of money. Unless you can walk to the city or hitch a lift, you need to pay for transport. If you're poor, this can be a major stumbling block. Secondly, members of your family may object to the idea of your moving away. And that too can be a difficult obstacle to overcome. Well, that's all I have to say on the Sao Paulo case study. But if you're interested in following it up or finding out more about the city, there's a reading list on this handout which I'm going to pass around now. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 6. Focus on listening 1. Student interviews. Section 1. You are going to hear interviews between a student counsellor and two students. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5.
Now listen to the first interview and answer questions one to five. Write no more than three words for each answer. Hi, come in. Take a seat. We haven't met before, have we? No. Didn't think so. Well, I'm Rob. I'm one of the student councillors here. And you are? Linda Richmond. Right. And which course are you on, Linda? I'm doing computer studies. OK. Now, the reason for this little chat is that we wanted to find out a bit about what students do when they're not studying, how you relax, what activities you do, things like that. But in particular, we'd like to know if there's anything we can do to improve the facilities available to students, OK? OK. So, tell me, where are you living at the moment? On campus. That's good. At least you don't have to worry about commuting if you're on campus. <laughs> No, but it can be a bit of a problem getting into town in the evening. I suppose that's true. Swings and roundabouts. But tell me, do you belong to any of the student clubs? Yes. I joined the film society when I first arrived, and I probably go along two, three times a week. Movies are great. They take your mind off your work and everything. Good. And that's it? That's it. <laughs> so, what do you think of the facilities in general? They're quite good. In my opinion, anyway. Any suggestions for improvements? Well, I think the one thing that's really needed is a new gym. You don't think the current gym is adequate? Mm. The thing is, it's nowhere near big enough. You can hardly ever get to use it, except at 8 o'clock in the morning, maybe. And the equipment's out of the ark. It really needs updating. No, a new gym would be fantastic. OK. And finally, are there any other activities you do in your spare time? Mm, I do quite a bit of cooking. <laughs> it's the best way I know of relaxing. My speciality is curry. I'm always playing around with new recipes. Great. That's been very helpful. Many thanks. Now look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to the second interview and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, so could I have your name? Jim. Jim Maybury. Jim, uh, sorry, how do you spell your surname? M-A-Y-B-U-R-Y. Maybury, thanks. And what course are you doing, Jim? Marine biology. And how's it going? Fine, so far. Good, good. And where are you living? I've got a place five kilometres from college. Excellent. And student clubs, societies, do you belong to anything in particular? Yes, I'm a member of the athletics club. We've just got back from an inter-university athletics tournament, actually. And how did you get on? We came second. Well done. That's quite an achievement. So you're obviously into sport, and what do you think of the university facilities? To be honest, I think they're a bit limited. Compared with other universities I know, anyway. I see. And what improvements would you like to see? The number one priority, as far as I'm concerned, is a swimming pool. I can't believe a university this size hasn't got one. It's crazy for students to have to go to the public pool in town. Yes, I must say you're not the first person to mention that. Actually, there is talk of a major fundraising campaign for new facilities, so maybe there's hope on the horizon. Hmm. Anyway, last question. Do you take part in any other activities to relax or whatever? I play the guitar mostly. It's something I've always done and it's great for winding down. Terrific. Thanks, Jim. Good luck with the course. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 6. Focus on listening to 10 ways to slow down your life. Section 2. 
you're going to hear a speaker giving advice about how to deal with stress in everyday life. First, look at questions 1 to 6. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 1 to 6. We hear an awful lot about stress these days. There seems to be more pressure in everyone's life. So, is there anything we can do about it? Well, I think there is. And I'm going to suggest a few ways of slowing down the pace of life and making things a little less frenetic. Let's talk about working hours first. Do you find yourself working later each day just to deal with your workload? The problem is that you'll be even less able to cope the next day if you don't give yourself time to relax. So, my first tip is to set a finishing time and then make sure you keep to it. That's unless you have a real crisis to deal with, of course. Next, what do you do at midday? Do you just eat a sandwich at your desk or, worse still, skip lunch altogether? Well, nobody can work efficiently for eight hours non-stop. So the next tip is to give yourself a proper lunch break. I mean one that lasts at least 30 minutes. And do try to get away from your desk. Get some fresh air. And what about all those messages which are waiting for a reply? Don't panic. Start each day by putting things in order of priority. Deal with the most urgent emails, faxes or phone calls first. The less important ones can wait. Remember, it's important to take control of technology rather than letting technology take control of you. Now, do you suffer from clutter? I mean, all the stuff that lies around on your desk because you don't know what to do with it. Well, there's a very useful piece of equipment called the waste paper bin, and that's the best place for an awful lot of clutter. So use the bin for what it's there for. Be ruthless. You'll tackle the important things much more effectively with a clear desk. It's important to be realistic. You won't always be able to clear your in-tray by the time you leave. But don't worry if there's still some work. The chances are that you'll be able to deal with the in-tray much more efficiently next day. Remember, work should be fun. Really. But if you do find that things are getting on top of you, go and find someone to talk to. Only don't talk shop. Pick something to talk about that's outside work. A football match, say, or a film. You'll feel much better, believe me. Now look at questions 7 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 7 to 10. OK, let's think about home now. The important thing when you get home is to forget about work. Don't go on about the awful day you've had. Make a point of listening to other people instead. Find out what's been happening in their lives. And what do you do to relax in the evening? The main activity for most of us, I'm afraid, is watching television. The problem with this is that it's a passive activity. It won't recharge your batteries and it won't re-energize you. So give the TV a miss and do something with your friends or family instead. That's far better relaxation. Another good way to use your leisure time is to do something for someone else. After all, life is about more than making money or passing exams. Why not get involved in your local community in some way? You could lend a hand at your local school or old people's home, for example, or help raise money for a local charity. And finally, why not take up a new activity? Maybe something you've always wanted to do but weren't sure you were capable of? You could join a painting class, for example, or take lessons on a musical instrument. 
You could even take up a new sport, like water skiing. Why not? You might discover a talent you never knew you had. And on that positive note, I think I'd better stop, and maybe if there are some questions... That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 8. Focus on listening 1. Music Festival. Section 1. In this section, you'll hear two friends, Andy and Maria, talking about a music festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Oh, good, Maria. I was hoping to catch you. Hi, Andy. What's up? Well, there's a group of us thinking of going to the music festival, and we wondered if you'd be interested in coming along. Sorry? What music festival? Didn't you know? There's going to be a big international music festival here with loads of famous names performing. I'm not really into classical music. Oh, it's not just classical music. There's all sorts. Um, just a minute, I've got the programme here. Yes, there's world music from an incredible variety of countries. Scottish and Irish folk music, for example. West African percussion, Russian choral music, which should be fantastic. Indian classical music, I could go on and on. Mm. And then, if you're a jazz fan, there's a special jazz weekend, and also a whole day of contemporary music. Any rock music? Uh, afraid not. Still, it sounds interesting. When is it exactly? It's in May. Oh, I'm going to be away the first week of May. I don't get back till the 12th. Well, that's OK, because it doesn't start until the 9th, and we were thinking of going the following weekend. That's Saturday the 16th. Fine. Anyway, it's on for a whole fortnight, so there'll be plenty of time to enjoy it. Andy gives Maria more information about the festival. Look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 4 to 10. Write no more than three words for each answer. Look, uh, let me tell you the things we were thinking of going to and you can say if you're interested in joining us. OK. Right, well, on the Saturday there's a talk about Cuban music. It's not only a talk, actually. There's a demonstration of all the different styles as well. Oh. That's at half past ten in the morning and tickets cost six pounds. Sounds great. And then in the afternoon there's something called The Sounds of Scotland at two o'clock. I love Scottish music. Me too. The tickets for that are eight pounds. And then the next day... The Sunday? Yes. There's a fantastic band from the Gambia who play all kinds of traditional music. Mm. And they've got a stunning lead singer, apparently. The concert's at seven o'clock in the evening and it's called Africa Alive. Africa Alive? Yes, the tickets are fifteen pounds. They're a bit more expensive because it's an evening concert, I suppose. What do you think? Yes, count me in, definitely. Great. Then, getting away from music, they're doing a special cruise on a canal boat, including lunch and also a talk about the canal and its history. It's on Sunday afternoon and it costs, let me see, yes, fourteen pounds fifty. 
I think that might be stretching the budget a bit too far. <laughs> OK. Well, three out of four isn't bad. Uh, and then there are loads of other things going on at the same time as well. Art exhibitions and stuff. We like the sound of the bus stop gallery. The what? The bus stop gallery. It's an art exhibition on a bus which tours around the country. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the bus is going to be at the festival and we thought we'd go along sometime. Why not? Look, uh, shall I give you some money now? No, wait till I've got the tickets. By the way, students can get a discount on the price of the tickets, but you might have to show your student card when you go in. So, can you remember to have it with you? Sure. Anyway, I must fly. See you. Thanks, Andy. Bye. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. End of side one. Cassette 1, side 2. Unit 8. Focus on listening to the Museum of Anthropology. Section 2. You'll hear a reporter talking on the radio about a museum. First, look at questions 1 to 6. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 1 to 6. It's time for our regular Museum of the Week spot on the programme, and here's Tom Brisley to tell us about it. Where is it you've been, Tom? Well, I've just come back from Vancouver, Sue, and I must say I had a fantastic time. There's so much to see and do in the city. But if you get a chance to go there, there's one place you mustn't miss, and that's the Museum of Anthropology. It was certainly one of the highlights of my time in Canada. The museum was actually established way back in 1949, and these days it's one of the most popular in Canada. It's worth going there just to see the building, in fact, because it's stunningly modern and dramatic. It's hard to believe it was built back in 1976. One very good thing is that the museum's all on one floor, which makes it easily accessible for wheelchairs. Another plus is that it's in the most beautiful setting overlooking the sea and inside you can see archaeological and ethnographical material from all over the world although what the museum is best known for is its collection of art and culture from the native people of the Pacific Northwest it's not a large museum so it's quite easy to find your way around when you arrive you come into an entrance lobby with a small shop on the right where you can buy guidebooks and some interesting souvenirs then, if you walk straight ahead, you'll go down a sloping ramp until you come to a kind of crossroads with an information desk. 
It's worth spending a few minutes there, because the staff are very helpful, and you can pick up various useful maps and leaflets. If you turn left at this point, there's a large ceramics gallery, and if you turn right, you'll eventually come to the theatre. But instead, keep walking straight ahead in the same direction as the ramp, and you'll find yourself in the museum's most impressive room, the Great Hall. This was designed to house 30 of the museum's largest totem poles, and it's absolutely spectacular. The glass walls are 15 metres high, and the whole design is based on the structure of the native wooden houses. Now look at questions 7 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 7 to 10. After that, you can enjoy just wandering around the various galleries. Oh, don't miss the rotunda, which is the setting for a beautiful modern sculpture called The Raven and the First Men. It's carved from a huge block of cedar wood, and it took five people over three years to complete. One of the best things about the museum, by the way, is that nothing is hidden away in storerooms. Everything is on show in a fascinating section called Visible Storage. Now, a few practicalities. The museum is situated on the University of British Columbia campus, which is quite a long way out of Vancouver City, so you'll need to take a bus to get there. Take a number 10 or a number 4 from town and stay on till the end of the line. Finally, it's a good idea to check the opening times before you go. If you visit in the winter, Remember that the museum is closed on Mondays. During the summer months, it's open daily. It's also worth noting that there's late opening till nine in the evening on Tuesdays, and that's all year round. If you want more information, the museum has a useful website, which you'll find on our fact sheet. Oh, many thanks for that, Tom. And that report brings us to the end of the program. And in next... That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 10. Focus on listening 1. Predicting a volcanic eruption. Section 3. In this section, you'll hear a conversation between two students about an assignment on volcanoes. First, look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and label the diagram. Hi, Alan. Long time no see. Oh, hi, Sarah. You look busy. What is it? An assignment? Yes, on volcanoes. But I'm having a bit of trouble with it. We did that one last year. What's the problem? Well, I'm looking at ways of predicting when a volcano is likely to erupt. And I've come across this diagram looks interesting. Yeah. Can I see? Sure. It's from a leaflet they give to local people in the Philippines and it shows the different signs to look out for. The trouble is, they're not all labelled. Mm. Oh, we can probably work out what the rest are. <laughs> Let's have a go. Oh, okay, great. 
Well, uh, starting at the top, there's that cloud of smoke or vapour or whatever. And it's at three different levels. High, medium and low. I assume that must be the height of the cloud. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Oh, right. But then we've also got strong, moderate and weak. I'm not sure. Could that be force, do you think? Mm, I wouldn't have thought so, no. That'll be the volume of the cloud. Um, how large it is, basically. The bigger it is, the more likelihood there is of an eruption. Yes, that makes sense. Now, moving down, we've got something labelled dome growth. Dome, that's the top of the volcano. Right. Hmm. And then ashfall, which is? See those little spots? I think you get particles of ash raining down. Ah, oh, from the cloud, I see. Mm. Uh, then, up on the slope of the volcano, there's a tree or a bush or something. Yes, that'll be drying vegetation. As I remember, volcanoes give off an enormous amount of heat before they erupt. Mm. And that causes plants and trees and things to dry. I'm impressed. How do you remember all this stuff? Just my natural brilliance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and then, what's that thing that looks like a hole in the slope? I think it's meant to show a landslide. Oh, really? Well, I'll have to take your word for that. I suppose it's not that easy to illustrate. Okay, landslide it is. And then we've got... Yes, must be rain. Well done. <laughs> oh, thanks. And a river of some kind. Would it be a river of lava? No, no, not before an eruption, surely. No. I think you'll find that's mud flow. But do you write that as one word or two? Mud flow, one word. Right. They can happen before a volcanic eruption as well as during. And if I remember rightly, they can travel at anything up to 100 kilometers an hour. Wow, really? You wouldn't want to get in the way of one of those, would you? Okay, now, what about these two little houses? They seem to be shaking. That's got to be an earthquake, right? Do you get earthquakes at the same time as volcanoes? Uh-huh. I think the two things are very often linked, in fact. Right. Then there are things like... Well, like little flower pots. And a sign saying no water. I guess they're wells. So, wells drying up. What do you think? Yeah, sounds about right for that one. Mm. Next, there's a horse which looks as if it's going a bit crazy. Yes. That's a very interesting phenomenon. Apparently, some animals can sense when there's a disaster coming, and they behave in strange ways. Dogs start barking, geese fly into trees, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> I think we can call it abnormal animal behavior. Yeah, I remember reading about something like that in Japan. Abnormal animal behavior. Mm. I got that. Okay. Next, there are obviously some unusual sounds to listen out for. Mm. Before an eruption, you get a rumbling sound, like thunder. Oh, thunder's bad enough. Volcano rumbling must be absolutely terrifying. Right, only one left now. And that's to do with smell, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Quite an unpleasant smell by the look of it. <laughs> yes. Volcanoes give off various gases. And one of the most obvious warning signs is a sulphur smell. It's pretty unmistakable. Sulfur. Phew, nasty. Mm. Okay, well, I think that's it, finally. Fantastic. You've been a great help, Sarah. Thanks a million. No problem. But I'd better fly or I'll be late. Good luck with the assignment. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 10. Focus on listening to Tsunami. Section 4. You'll hear part of a lecture on natural hazards connected with the sea. 
First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Now listen carefully and label the diagram. Good morning. Today we're going to look at natural hazards connected with the oceans. As you know, more than two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And the main hazards, both at sea and along the shore, are caused by waves. Now, waves can be measured in various ways. So, first of all, I'd like to clarify a few of the terms we need to use. If you could just turn to the diagram on page 82. Right? Now, you see the waves running across the center and the seafloor at the bottom? Okay. Well, the highest point of a wave is called the crest. Remember the saying, to be on the crest of a wave, to be very successful? Yeah? Then an important measurement, wavelength, which is the distance between the highest point of one wave and the next. Wavelengths can vary enormously, from a few meters to hundreds of kilometers, believe it or not. So far, so good. What else? Uh, there's wave period, which isn't marked because it's a measurement of time. It's the time between one wave crest passing and the next then the lowest point of a wave is known as the trough. Can you see that? That leaves wave height, which is a measurement of the vertical distance between the crest of a wave and the trough. And finally, depth, which, as I'm sure you know, is the distance between the mean sea level and the seabed. In the second part, the speaker discusses tsunami waves. Look at questions 4 to 10. Now answer questions 4 to 10. Right. Well, most waves are produced by the effect of wind. But the most destructive waves of all are not, in fact, wind-generated. These are the famous tsunami. The word tsunami, by the way, is Japanese for harbor wave. The majority of tsunami are caused by earthquakes which occur under the seabed although a few are also caused by underwater volcanic eruptions. Most tsunami, that's between 80 and 90 percent, take place in the Pacific Ocean. This is because the majority of the Earth's earthquakes happen around that ocean in the so-called Ring of Fire. While they're in the open sea, tsunami waves are generally quite small, rarely more than half a meter high, in fact. That usually surprises people. It's only when they reach the shore that tsunami waves reach such enormous heights. As a matter of interest, the largest tsunami ever recorded was 64 meters high. That was in Russia in 1737. It's also worth noting that tsunami have extremely long wavelengths. In the Pacific Ocean, for example, the average wavelength is 480 kilometers. This low height and long wavelength makes it difficult to detect a tsunami in the open sea. The deeper the water, the faster the tsunami travels. And in the Pacific, they can reach speeds of up to 700 kilometers an hour. In 1960, a tsunami generated by an earthquake in Chile reached Japan in only 22 hours. Let's look at another example now. 
The 1964 tsunami which hit Crescent City in the far north of California. This was caused by an earthquake which happened in Alaska four and a half hours earlier. The first two waves only hit the area around the harbor, but the third washed inland for a distance of 500 meters. It flooded 30 city blocks and destroyed a number of small one-story buildings. Luckily, there had been enough warning for people to evacuate the low-lying areas close to the seashore. But the city authorities learned an important lesson, and they took steps to prevent the worst of the damage from happening again. They turned the main risk area into a public park and relocated all the businesses on higher ground. Incidentally, this approach has also been taken in Hawaii and Japan. Now, before we finish, I'd just like to look at one more hazard. Storm chasing. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 12. Focus on listening 1. The Golden Rules of Listening. Section 2. You will hear a short radio talk on the skill of listening. First, look at questions 1 and 2. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions one and two. And now it's time for the first in a new series called Get the Message, which looks at communication skills and how to improve them. Here's Francis Stevens to present it. Hello. I think we'd all agree that good communication is vital, whether it's at home, at work, or in personal relationships. So what are the key communication skills, and how can we improve them? I'll be trying to answer those questions over the next four weeks. We'll be looking at the skill of speaking, and considering how to express yourself clearly in a discussion, for example, or how to make a good impression in a job interview. We'll also be thinking about writing, including how to write an effective letter of complaint, and the uses and abuses of email. And finally, we'll be examining gestures and other aspects of body language and considering the effect this has on face-to-face -face communication. But today, I'm going to start by focusing on the skill of listening. Now look at questions 3 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 3 to 10. Now, listening is a far more sophisticated skill than most people realize. And poor listening is a very common cause of breakdowns in communication. So you need to be aware of a few rules. The first golden rule of listening is to stop talking. Because you can't listen carefully if you keep interrupting. This is especially important when the situation is familiar, when you're talking to a relative or friend, say. In situations like that, it's all too easy to assume you know what the person means and start working out your reply instead of paying attention to what they're really saying. Next, try to relax. Research has shown that it's much more difficult to listen effectively if you're feeling at all tense and anxious. 
So, if you've been dealing with a tricky problem at work, for example, and you feel the tension building up, take a deep breath before you answer the telephone. Let your brain adjust first. You also need to make the speaker feel relaxed. And the way to do that is to show them they have your full attention. Try to look interested in what they're saying. Don't look over their shoulder or start scribbling on a piece of paper. Of course, there may be reasons why you want to make notes. In this case, tell the speaker in advance and explain the reason. Say the notes are to help you remember exactly what they said. Blame your poor memory if you like. This is important because we often use facial expression to tell us how the conversation is going. Next, be aware of any prejudices you have, personal, political, whatever, and make a conscious effort not to let these views affect your judgment. You may not see things in exactly the same way as the other person, but that shouldn't stop you from trying to understand their point of view. It's important to realize that listening is an active process. To listen effectively, you need to use not only reason, but also feeling. That means trying to identify with the other person and putting yourself in their position. After all, the point of listening is to understand the other person's point of view, not to win an argument. If you can empathize with the speaker, you're much less likely to jump to the wrong conclusion. And one final point. Remember to listen for what the speaker is not saying. That sounds strange, I know, but very often what's missing from a conversation is at least as important as what's there. Now, to discuss some of these points, I've got with me in the studio Brian Morgan, who's a psychologist, and Tessa Wade, who works as a marriage guidance counselor. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 12. Focus on listening to Making the most of your memory. Section 4. You will hear a lecturer talking about memory. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Use no more than three words for each answer. Now, today we're looking at memory, how it operates, and how you can make the most of it. That's if I remembered to bring my notes with me. Uh, they're here somewhere. Uh, don't worry, just kidding. Okay, let's take a look at how memory works. In order for you to remember something, your brain has to perform a number of operations. First, the information has to be encoded, that is, taken in and processed. Then the information has to be held until it's needed, which is the storage system of the brain. Finally, it needs to be retrieved so that it can be used. Most of us have problems with our memory at some time or other, and the older you are, the more likely this is to happen. Exactly how your memory suffers depends on which of your brain's systems is most vulnerable. Another distinction we have to draw is between verbal and visual memory. Think about finding your way in a strange town. You may prefer to take in information verbally. For example, turn left at the cathedral, etc. On the other hand, you may absorb information better in the form of a mental picture. 
To make the most of your memory, you need to use all these different systems to the full. Another way of improving memory is with a method known as PQRST. This is a way of linking something you're trying to learn to what you already know. In this method, the P stands for preview, that is glancing through the text before reading it carefully. Then Q for question, R for read, and S, anyone care to hazard a guess? Well, it stands for state, as in to make a statement. And lastly, the T stands for test. In the second part, the speaker talks about how to make effective use of your memory. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 5 to 10. Okay, well, let's look at those five steps a little more closely. If you've got an article, say, to read, the first thing to do is to look through it quickly without worrying about every word. And when you've done that, you have to ask yourself, what do I know about this topic already? Only then should you read the article carefully. And when you've done that, you need to review the contents. That means thinking about how the contents relate to what you already know about the subject. Finally, you should make a habit of testing yourself about what you've read. The brain also has another type of memory system, which is called implicit memory. And this enables us to absorb information without paying attention to it. it sounds good, doesn't it? But there's a catch. If this system is to work efficiently, it's crucial that you don't make any mistakes while you're learning. If you're trying to learn a long list of vocabulary, for example, you may guess a few wrong meanings, and then your memory is likely to end up holding on to those wrong meanings. So the best approach is to only test yourself on what you know well. If you learn a few words at a time and gradually build up the list, you'll learn better than if you try to learn 200 words all at once. Little and often is the rule. Now, here's something that might interest you. There's been some research in California which suggests that living a life of luxury can make you more intelligent. Scientists divided a group of 24 mice into two groups. One group was kept in standard conditions with as much food and water as they wanted. The other group was kept in luxury with larger cages, comfortable bedding, and tasty snacks. And after 40 days, this second group of mice were found to have 15% more cell matter in the part of the brain that deals with learning and memory. Makes you think, doesn't it? So I'd suggest you go out and pamper yourself a bit before the exams. <laughs> but seriously, I'd like now to look at some other research into the mechanisms of learning and memory. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 14. Focus on listening 1. Media survey. Section 1. A woman is carrying out a survey about how people use different media. Listen to the conversation between the woman and a man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6.
Now listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Excuse me, have you got a few minutes to answer some questions? What about? I'm doing a survey about how people use the media. Things like newspapers, television, computers, etc. I see. Uh, well, OK. Can I start by taking a few personal details? Don't worry, it's completely confidential. Sure. First, could I have your name? Yes, uh, Philip Matthews. That's M A T T H E W S. Matthews, right. Got it. And do you mind if I ask your age? No, that's all right. I'm 21. I'll be 22 next week, as it happens. Oh, and many happy returns in advance. Thanks. And what's your occupation? I suppose I'd have to say full-time student. Is that an occupation? <laughs> it certainly is. OK, now turning to the survey proper. Do you buy a daily paper? No. I usually get one on Saturdays, so. though. What's the first thing you turn to in the newspaper? That's easy, the sports section. Doesn't everyone? <laughs> You've got to check on your team's progress, read the match report, haven't you? And after that, I generally have a quick look at the news. When you say news, is that local, national or international? Oh, I'd say national news, not local. Nothing very exciting happens around here. <laughs> and I'm not terribly up on international affairs. And are there any other sections you read regularly? Business, for example? No, you must be joking. Business bores me stiff, I'm afraid. Uh, let me think. Um, I might have a look at the art section once in a while, but not as a regular thing. I suppose the only other thing I make a point of looking at is the TV reviews. You watch a lot of TV? Afraid I do, yes. Too much, probably. <laughs> right. That's it for that section. The woman asks the man some more questions. Look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 7 to 10. Well, if we could turn to TV and radio now... Right. Is there any particular kind of TV programme you watch? Well, the news, obviously, and sport. Mm -hmm. But mostly, I want to be entertained. I like a good TV drama, <laughs> something with a strong plot that you can get involved in. I don't watch a lot of documentaries, to be honest, and most of the comedies and quiz shows, they leave me cold. And do you listen to the radio at all? In the mornings, I do. I prefer it to breakfast TV, but that's about the only time. So, would you say you got most of your information from television? Yes, I suppose I would. As I said, I don't go in for a daily paper. And finally, just a couple more questions. Do you use a computer? Yes. And what would you say you use it for mostly? Mmm, that's a hard one. I mean, I use it for computer games like everyone else. But I've been cutting down on that lately. I think. At the moment, I probably use it most for typing up lecture notes and other coursework, like assignments. I did once try to keep an account of my spending on it, but <laughs> I didn't get very far. <laughs> do you have internet access? Yes. How do you use that mainly? Well, it can be very useful for college work. I found an awful lot of information surfing the web. But in answer to your question, I think I'd have to say email. Mm -hmm. It's just a great way of keeping in touch with friends, especially the ones I have abroad. Mm. How about online banking? Have you thought about that? Not while I've got an overdraft, no. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. OK, well, thanks very much for your time. Is that it? Yep, that's it. OK, well, cheers. That is the end of the section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Unit 14. 
Focus on listening to Couch Potatoes Section 3 In this section, you will hear a discussion between two students, Amy and Jonathan, and a university tutor. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about statistics relating to television and other home entertainment. First, look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi, Amy, Jonathan. Do sit down. OK, we're talking about the media today and I think, Amy, you were going to start us off. Yes, I found a couple of pieces of information on the internet. Fine. OK, well, one was a survey of television viewing habits looking at heavy viewers in different countries. And a heavy viewer is... Yes, sorry. It's someone who watches TV for more than two hours a day. Anyway, there were two countries where more than 50% of the people were heavy viewers. The UK came top with 58%, and New Zealand wasn't far behind with 53%. Some of the other results were quite surprising, actually. For example? Well, I would have expected the USA to be high on the list, but it came quite far down, with 40%. Other countries, like Germany, were much higher. And then the country with fewest heavy viewers turned out to be Switzerland. I would have guessed maybe Portugal. Thanks. Well, that's useful data. Anything else to report? Yes. I also found a breakdown of TV programmes shown in an average week. It's only for one channel, but it's probably fairly typical. There are basically two major areas which account for most of the time. One is news stroke factual. Sorry, what do you mean by factual? Documentaries, current affairs, things like that. And the other is drama stroke entertainment. OK. Well, news and factual programmes take up just over a quarter of the week. But drama and entertainment is much more popular. That accounts for about half the week's viewing. And the remaining time, what's that, about another quarter, I suppose, is all the other things like sport, education, the arts, etc. OK. Well, you might want to try and get data for one or two other countries, perhaps. Anyway, thanks for that, Amy. Now, Jonathan, over to you. OK. Well, I was interested in how children use the media, and I thought I'd look at the kind of home entertainment equipment children have access to. Well, that's an interesting angle. What equipment, specifically? Basically, video recorders, CD players and satellite TV. Right. Well, video recorders seem to be pretty well universal nowadays. Almost every home with children has one. And that's been the case for at least ten years. On the other hand, CD players used to be a lot less common. But there's been a steady increase in recent years, and now about two-thirds of families have one. Then finally, satellite TV. That was fairly rare to begin with. But again, there's been a gradual increase, and nowadays it's in about a quarter of homes with children. That's useful data. Good. In the second part of the discussion, they discuss children's use of the media in more detail. Look at questions 5 to 10 first. <laughs> 